Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today, once again, I am joined by Matt Hot of SimTac Consulting to play with some weird shotgun stuff. So, you've got the same shotgun you brought last time, which is still pretty cool. What is that? This is a Remington 870 Wingmaster that was built and made for the Ohio National Guard about 1975. And it's even got a big old picture of Ohio there on the side. Yeah, it's got a big engraving of Ohio and ONG. Um, yeah, it's got a bayonet lug, which is very rare to see. Um, three round mag extension, sling swivels, so it's set up as a riot gun. Yep. Uh, the classic style. All right, and so that has just a plain a cylinder bore choke? Yep, cylinder bore barrel. So that's going to be our control gun, because what we're testing today is this guy, which is an A&W diverter. So the last time we were out, we took a look at a duckbill. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you haven't seen that video, you should check it out. We'll have a link at the end of this one. But this is kind of the other style of duckbill sort of muzzle device. And the idea of this, just like the other duckbill, is to turn your circular group into an oval group. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting, there's, there's a little more information available on these because this was actually a commercial product. Um, and some of the initiative for this actually came from the US Air Force who wanted it for air-based defense. And they were actually more interested in riot control than they were in combat effectiveness. And the general consensus on these at the time was that this sort of diverter is great for riot control because it increases your hit probability by increasing the size of the, the spread and by limiting the height because people are only about this tall. Mm -hmm. If you want to hit more people, make the spread wider. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, it reduced the lethality. Uh, well, that was the theory, at least. Right. Well, <laughs> the idea was by making a bigger pattern, you're reducing pattern density. Mm -hmm. uh, and for a riot control situation, now you talk about self-defense and law enforcement use of shotguns. In the 60s, the riot defense use of a or riot control use of a shotgun was loaded up with birdshot and hit as many people as possible, i.e. with a diverter, uh, because it's probably not going to kill anyone. That's, yeah. is, that, is that still the, uh, the accepted <laughs> methodology? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Birdshot is considered lethal force, yeah. and it's less likely to kill you. That's why I don't recommend it as a defensive uh, load, but it is still absolutely capable of producing serious or lethal injury. Yeah. Uh, and you should never, ever, ever use it as a less lethal alternative to proper buckshot. Yeah. Yep. And so when you take this into combat, then things change a little bit. You do get a very nice oval pattern. Mm -hmm. um, as I recall, it, it was ideal with number four buckshot. Yes. Uh, which makes sense because that's what they thought at the time was the ideal combat loading for shotguns, number four buck. Well, it, it's small enough to squeeze through without as much pellet deformation as the larger shot sizes, and it has a little more pattern density. Right. Is it How many pellets are in the standard number four buck round? Uh, 24, 27, somewhere around there, depending on the loading. Okay, as compared to nine in, in double, double lock. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, we've been yakking a bit much here. Uh, the goal today is to try out this thing. We mm -hmm. know the duck bill worked. Let's see if this actually works. Let's give it a shot. All right, so we're at 10 yards. Uh, we're gonna try out uh, bird shot, number four buck, uh, number one buck, number double lot buck, uh, and that's it. Yep, we're, we're actually gonna happens. do bird shot this time. Yes. We listen to you. <laughs> All right, let's get started. <laughs> All right, Matt's gonna start us off uh, with a round of number eight bird shot. This is Winchester double A, two and three quarter inch. Uh, heavy target load. So he'll take the left side and then I'll take the right side. Take it away. Let's have a look. So the regular cylinder bore gun did exactly as you would expect. We've got our bottom pallets here up to there. Pretty much a, you know, a perfectly cylindrical uh, pattern. And then the diverter also did exactly what it was advertised to do. So we've got pellets as far over as here, all the way to here, which is, <laughs> that is a 36 inch wide oval wow. at 10 yards. And it's much more dense in the middle of the pattern in a line there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so we have a little bit of up here, almost nothing down here. 
Uh, overall height at the widest is one foot. So that's a three to one pattern. That's that's actually a more... Now we didn't try the duckbill with birdshot. We did not. But compared to all of the other ammunition types that we used, we didn't get anything with the duckbill that was this exaggerated. Yeah, and especially with the with the extreme change in pattern density between the center line and the outlying edges north and south, yeah, that's that's real dramatic. Yeah. All right. Well, um, you know, this aside from the questionable riot use, this wasn't meant for a bird shot. So let's let's jump it up to number four buck and see what happens. Nice. All right, now we have S and B number four buckshot, and uh, we will each be firing two rounds of this just so that we can get a deliberately denser pattern so that we can see its shape. Uh, this is how we did the duckbill gun, uh, the duckbill testing, and there are pros and cons to it, but I think it gives us a better idea of what the, the shotguns are actually doing. So take it away, Matt. Eyes and ears, eyes and ears. I can already tell that did what it was advertised. Let's go take a look. Once again, cylinder bore gives you a cylinder pattern. So we've got nine inches, edge to edge there. Yeah, oh, don't yeah, forget we, that little oh, guy. We got that little guy. I am gonna worry about that little guy. Mm -hmm. There you go, 11 inch, basically a nine inch. Yeah. Um, that guy would be having a real bad day. Yeah, that would, uh, it would not be fun to be him. There's your wad. <laughs> yeah, <there's... laughs> S and B wads, man, these things stink when you shoot them. Yeah. That once again did exactly what was advertised. So we got a pellet there. We got a pellet here. I don't know that for me. Twenty nine inches, and it's this thing's not so much an oval as almost just a straight line. Yeah, I mean you got one little flyer up here, but for the most part it's just stretched right across uh, the midsection there. That's five inches. Yeah. If we discount that little guy. Um, we got one over here as well, but yeah. even even if we take those into account, we're talking about yeah, eight. Nine, yeah, eight inches. So this is this is easily even, a three to one, three and a half to one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. Does exactly what they said it would do with the yeah. loads that they said it would do it with. It's interesting to me that this is actually better than the duckbill. Yeah, it is. The duckbill was duck making more an, of an oval. oval. Um, it was, and and what's interesting to me is the duckbill was an oval that was very evenly spread out mm -hmm. or very evenly uh, distributed, mm -hmm. and we we noticed that at the time and commented on it. This is far less distributed, but it's putting the pellets exactly where you would want them. Yeah, it's definitely accomplishing that mission, and you can argue whether that mission was you know <laughs> useful or right. not. But for what it set out to do, it's doing it better. The answer is yes. We don't know if anyone ever asked the question. Yeah. But the answer is yes. <laughs> All right. We need to step it up a couple more times. Um, number one buck. Let's try number one. I think your second shot was a little bit high. I think I shot the second one high too, yeah. You know, yeah. that'll teach me. No worries. Let's see what this one does. So what I'm seeing here is basically the exact same pattern, uh, independent of pellet size. Uh, yeah, I, I shanked that that second shot a bit high, but that was on me. Oh, we do got one little flyer up here. Uh, I think that's a wad. Oh, oh you're right. Yeah. Um, so in 10 inches, we had nine inches last time. If you brought a couple of these down, I mean, this is basically the same thing over and over. Cylinder bores do cylinder bore things. Now here, I'm not seeing quite the same level of effectiveness that we had before. No, it's still squashed a little bit, but it ain't near as pronounced as the smaller pellet sizes. I think yep. those are number fours. Yep. These are all old. That one's new. That one's new. That's and a number that. of one pellet. So we've got 27 inches of width. One down here. So, and we're talking about 10 inches yeah. of height, which is still a decent, 
spread based on those raw numbers, but as you can see here, it's not anywhere near as concentrated in the midsection. Exactly. It's yeah. a more even pellet dispersion across that, so it's not working. It's not doing what it's supposed to do as effectively with these larger pellet sizes. Yeah. All right, and lastly, uh, we don't actually have S and B this time, so we're using Winchester, uh, number double aught, nine pellet, thirteen hundred and twenty-five feet per second. Two rounds again. Go for it. Still did something. All right, well, I'm seeing pretty much the same thing again. I don't know that we really need to even measure this, but there you go, eight inches. Yep. Nice round pattern. Yeah, and speaking of which, one of the things that we are seeing here, uh, which is very, very typical of conventional buckshot and conventional barrels, is what we call a donut of death. Okay. So if you look, you've got all this shot around the periphery, but where the bead was is nothing. That's interesting. Yeah, there's a big open space in your pattern. Yeah, and you know, if that's where you're trying to put pellets, that's where the, the structures in the body you're trying to destroy, and you end up just getting peripheral hits, that's hmm. not good. Why um, is that? Where does that come from? Uh, as best I know, it comes from the pellets being deformed on their way down the barrel. They're knocking into each other. They're abrading against the, the inside of the barrel, and you get flat spots on the pellets. They're not perfectly spherical. They tend to veer off in weird directions, and they veer off everywhere except what they're supposed to be. Okay. Um, so if you want to get rid of this, you end up having to find a way to cushion those pellets to prevent that deformation. And that basically comes down to something like flight control buckshot uh, or van comp barrel or some combination thereof. Okay. All right. So once again, these holes are all from previous shots. So we that got... That one's fresh. I saw that one hit from back air. Yeah. So if we measure that guy out, got... 26 and a half inches. That's kind of interesting in that the width of our pattern has been pretty much standard. Like it hasn't varied much. You can see the, bir the birdshot got up to 36 inches. Yeah, the birdshot so, was a little more. So we're seeing some some gradual reduction in the width as we go up in shot size. Not as much as with the duck bill though. Not as much, no. Uh, now for height, see we got that guy and we got that guy. 12 inches. Yeah. This is definitely the the closer we've gotten to cylindrical or to circular. Yeah, it's like a well, two to cylindrical. one pattern. What's interesting to me is that it's getting more circular not because the edges are coming in, but because the top and the bottom are expanding. Yeah. And again, you've got that kind of donut of death even with this that we're seeing with double lock because those pellets are getting scrunched as they go through that thing. And we're amplifying this a bit even because this was two rounds. Mm -hmm. If if I had only fired one, you take out half of these pellets, and that's a very, a very loose pattern. Well, and I noticed on your first shot, I saw a hole over here on the edge, and on your second shot, I saw a hole, this hole pop up. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I think there may have been some of that in there, but... Okay. All right, Matt. Well, I got to say, I'm actually pretty impressed with this. I am, too. That, that surprised me. I was not expecting it. Um, I was kind of expecting that we'd get maybe the same as the duckbill, or not as good. Um, because, frankly, it's this is a commercial production thing that wasn't very successful. They're pretty hard to find these days. Yep. So I didn't expect it would actually work very well. And yet, I mean, the density of that stripe of buckshot that we saw, especially with the number four buck and the birdshot. Yeah. I mean, that was... It's impressive. Demonstrably better than the duckbill at whatever the two things were trying to do. <laughs> the, the answer for the question that almost nobody asked... Right. But it, it did it. And so, I mean, at least from a, you know, from an engineering standpoint, it's a really fascinating piece of kit. And, you know, we didn't talk about this before, but there was actually a lot of engineering that went into designing these things. So mm -hmm. it's got these three vents uh, behind the forcing cone or the choking cone. I'm not sure exactly what you'd call that on this. Um, but those are there deliberately to reduce gas pressure, to reduce turbulence on the pellets as they're forced through that cone. Um, the, the shape of the muzzle was was they put a lot of thought into it and the whole thing is made as an investment casting mm -hmm. so they calculated out the shape and then very specifically cast that instead of trying to make like the duck bills which are simple enough that you can just machine them on standard mill or lathe pretty mm -hmm. easily 
Um, this was a much more complicated thing to make. Uh, yeah. We should point out they made two versions of this, a Model 2 and a Model 4, which they describe as having a 2 to 1 and a 4 to 1 compression. This is a Model 4. This was the military envisioned, envisioned one mm -hmm. because it does what we saw. The Model 2 was actually redu uh, released for sporting uses. Mm -hmm. Figuring you squash it down a little bit, you're going to have an easier time hitting birds. You know, that brings up a good question. I mean, does it actually help you hit a fast-moving lateral target? How could anyone ever know? Well, we'd have to find a way to test it, I reckon. I think we should do that. Yeah. I think we also promised people that with the duck bill, but now we can actually do it. All right, so we'll have that video coming uh, at some point. We'll see if we can figure out how to do that and bring it to you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. I'd like to give a big thanks to Mike Carrick from Arms Heritage Magazine for providing uh, the diverter barrel uh, for this video. Thank you very much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. So last time we were out here, Ian promised you guys birdshot through the duck bill. But it was hot. We were tired. Well, I stole his gun. Let's see what happens. Have you seen the Auto 8? What? <laughs> All right, so that was something we ought to have done. It was. <laughs> it was. <laughs> now, we can't really tell exactly what we have going on at the side here. That side doesn't look a whole lot different. No, that might have a few extra pellets. We've definitely got a few extra ones in here. Yeah. Um, this was actually a pretty darn good group. Uh, the duckbill came back to being performing more like the diverter here. Yeah, it really reminds me of the diverter with just how squished that pattern is. Yeah. Now, that makes sense because when you've got this many little tiny pellets, Mo the vast majority of them are going to be inside the middle of the, the shot pattern, and they're not going to be bumping against uh, the outside of the barrel. Um, Charles Askin Sr., in a book he wrote back in the 1920s called Shotgunology, talks about this. Hmm. And he refers to the pellets on the outside edge that, that encounter friction against the barrel and flatten out. He calls that the strip. Hmm. And even back in that time, you know, 100 years ago almost, he talked about if we could figure out a wad technology or a barrel choking technology that reduces the amount of pellets in the strip, we could get a tighter patterning gun. Hmm. And guy's kind of prophetic, I think. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs>